Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to History Hat. This is Charlie today with the introduction, but I am joined by the wonderful Alex Churchill taking the helm. How are you, Alex? Uh, feeling like a third <gasps> wheel already, because um, <laughs> you and our guest, you've just you've just met. And it's like you've known each other for years. Tell us why this is. <laughs> Her previous book was The Tudor Socialite, but she's here to talk to us today about her newest book, The Plantagenet Socialite. Huzzah! Welcome, Jan. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, when you're looking at the Plantagenets, what sources do you use and how available are they? Well, I have to say, <clears throat> just before I go into that, my first idea was originally to lump Henry II, Richard and John sort of together as a sort of starting background chapter and start with Henry III because I didn't think there'd be much out there. But in the course of research, I found there was. I found them so fascinating, particularly King John, that uh, my wonderful editor, and he's wonderful, um, he trusted my judgment and he allowed me to write the longer book. And I have to say it was rather a longer book. And he extended the deadline a few times. <laughs> and as you say, the, the book is sort of like a prequel to the Tudor Socialite. I'll tell you how that came about quickly because it'll help you understand this book. My friends um, who, who liked history said, can't you write a history book without the boring bits? And I went, what do you mean? <laughs> they said, well, we want proper history. But we just want the ceremonies and the pageants and dresses of jewels and, you know, the tragedies, the love affairs. And yeah. I went, ah. So Amberly and I ended up talking um, because he turned down the first book I offered. Uh, but we carried on talking. And we got this idea of a socialite attached in some way to the royal court. And sort of copying the old fashioned chronicles and journals, uh, we transformed the idea into readable easy to digest eyewitness diary style entries mm -hmm. while still doing a narrative running so people got it in context and um, still portraying the key events you know the characters and all the things that the people wanted um and the socialite in my head became a person who was uh oh, attached to the court perhaps not intimately but enough to be able to see and hear things and when you look into it all actually there are so many people you could be attached to to know what's going on and that's the other thing I really found was when you looked at what people actually knew I mean we think we know everything today we've got social media we've got newspapers you know it is amazing how much people really found out so, so what sort um, of information can we learn of life at court and in the wider country without social media and tv um well what I found um just to sort of end um, the sources, um, because I'm writing in an informal way, there, there's no footnotes. So you've got an extensive bibliography and you'll see that there were contemporary eyewitness accounts of the chronicles, there were letters, there were records, itineraries, journals and anything I could find, even um, bylaws, statutes, proclamations. I mean, I found some wonderful proclamations about um, people uh, moving their human muck about. <laughs> Um, well, actually, it's uh, forbidden for those collecting ordure in their houses to place it on the king's highways. And it says <laughs> any person having any dung rate or removed to the front of others' houses will be fined and made to carry it back into their own house for a day and night. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, reading the words of people living, uh, you're gaining insight into what they're seeing and they're feeling, hearing, overhearing, maybe eavesdropping. Uh, and I, I wanted people to get the same wonder that I get from it all. And, and of course, uh, perhaps know a little bit more than we did before. Uh, of course, many Victorian academics searched the records and made them available for anyone to read. Uh, so 
Um, you can download them. People, are, I, I, well, when I first started this process, I was amazed at what I could find. Yeah. Um, and examples were like Chronicles of the Crusades by contemporary narratives. Um, there were obviously original letters of Thomas Beckett, which will come to I know at some point. Um, and I also have my own extensive library. And I write many of the entries like news stories or press releases. So uh, I found that helped me reading their words, bring the immediacy to what I was writing. Um, but the sort of thing you, you find, and sorry, Alex, I'm not ignoring you. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just listening away. This is not, not my bag. First World War historian, you two, listening to you two nerd out. There's no better way to learn. No better way. I mean, I'm literally like, what? They've not got books and newspapers? Uh, it's far too bad. Uh, so it, well, yeah, no better way for me to learn. <laughs> you asked me what you can learn anyway. And um, the royal household wasn't always in one place. It travelled. It's uh, what we call itinerant. And the servants, courtiers and everybody else attached to it travelled with it. And there's some rather interesting household accounts, which uh, you can get a hold of. Um, and of course, there were retinues of the courtiers, there were household officers, their wives, their children, mid lower raking servants, <laughs> you know, including things like musicians, entertainers, launderers, purveyors. So many departments made up the court with people close enough to be in there know about a lot of things. Mm. And in the mix, of course, you've got culture, you've got your politics, you've got justice especially the earlier times because the courts travelled with the court. I mean, the law courts travelled with the court, <laughs> uh, which was the king's way of a, helping with his own finances, but it mainly to find out what was happening in his kingdom and ensuring people knew who he was. He became a presence and he could show that he cared. I mean, that's simplistic, obviously. But of course, staying in other people's manors and castles, he could find out what his nobles were thinking um, and seeing how rich they were, of course, because, of course, I suppose King John would say it was a bit extortionate, um, and um, how they regarded their own particular domains um, and a way of building relationships with his nobles. So it was also an admin centre. It received foreign embassies, highest court of appeal. Um, by going around the wider country, though, the king could see whether his laws were being correctly applied. So, I think sometimes he could think about ways of making more money out of those laws by seeing the um, effects of them. Um, he could see how the population was, the agriculture, the trades, gave an idea of prices, how that was affecting people, food resources, all of which became more important as time went on. And he got all these people writing home or to their friends about what they were seeing and doing, listening, overhearing, <laughs> eavesdroppings. <laughs> uh, and so news was disseminated more easily than we realised. And actually, that was one of the things that made writing the chapter on Richard easier, Richard the Lionheart. Because I was like, how am I going to write about Richard? He's on the crusade. I don't want to go on the crusade. <laughs> nasty affair. Um, and, and then also know what's happening in England and make that believable. And then I realised, I saw all these various accounts and letters, and I realised I could see when they arrived in England, and I could use the news that's disseminated out to the wider population. And that's how I did it. So I um, found that when they were all coming back, I took a bit of working out. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like fitting together a sort of jigsaw puzzle on it, and it was a lot of fun to write that way. This, this is proper history alex first world war come on i've got gloves i've got gloves older than that that's just... who are basically mad carry on carry on i have at least heard of these people carry on with the next person i've definitely heard of him because it doesn't end well for him does it ah yes um thomas a beckett um oh yes we're gonna look at some <coughs> major events of the period and i want to find out what what happens to right. Tom yeah. and how does this saga unfold with the Plantagenet right. socialite? Are you ready? Go on, then. <laughs> Let me give a, a recap of his career as, as I kind of understood it and I have to say I, I was really surprised because like many who had never got further than the murder are taking certain things at face value like the fact he was a saint. Mm. Mm. 
one of the things um, that first gets mentioned about him from the very start is how much charm he had. And he charmed everyone, everyone. And, you know, from his father's house, he manages to charm his way into the household of the Archbishop of Canterbury, who makes him Archdeacon in 1155. He meets Henry through that role. And Henry's charmed by him and makes him Chancellor. <clears throat> and then after that, they became friends. And um, they they were like equals, which wasn't important first off, but you realise later how that may have affected things. And once he didn't need people anymore, that was it. So when the Archbishop is dying on his bed and asking for him to come back to see him, he, he, he doesn't respond at all. Anyway, part of um, whenever he gets a new role and he goes on campaign with Henry, um, and in 1159, he's going to be the best warrior of all when they go on campaign. And when Henry goes home, he leaves him behind. And Thomas rides at the head of men, 700 knights, 1,200 mercenaries, wow. 4,000 men at arms. A chronicler of the time said he put villages and farms to greedy flames without one thought of wow. pity. And I'm like, hang on a minute. Are so we this talking was the about same man? Um, well, well, it's not yet. <laughs> And then for some reason, Henry thought, oh, I've got a good friend in him. I'll make him Archbishop when um, the previous one died, as we mentioned above. And like he always did, he, he demurred at first. Oh, no, no. Um, he pointed to his rich, colourful clothes. Oh, you've selected a pretty costume to figure at the head of the monks of Canterbury. But you know what? He soon overcome that reluctance. And he was consecrated on the 3rd of June. And at the same time, gave up the chancellorship, which is not what Henry intended, of course. <laughs> and there was no need for him to do so. Um, anyway, there he is, praying on the altar steps, consecrated, tears in his eyes, announced, this day will forever after be kept at Canterbury as the feast of the Holy Trinity. I thought, hmm, rightio, shades. <laughs> <laughs> and he, behaved, he shaped his behaviour again by the role and his own... Um, chroniclers wrote that he rapidly attended church services. His own chaplain said um, he'd fancy he had before him the Lord's passion bodily in the flesh. He dressed in a black habit. He sat with monks in cloister. He ate only bread with a little partridge and hot water with herbs. He brought 26 poor men into hall to feed them. And yet John of Salisbury wrote that he told him the Pope throws in our tea that after everything Pope Adrian did for the see of Canterbury, you are allowing his mother to starve in cold and hunger. And I thought, yes, I'm beginning to see a pattern here. And then next, Henry tries to encourage a system of trial with a judge and 12 juries. Uh, he wanted common sense and knowledge of the law for, for all people. <clears throat> and of course, there were many kinds of courts then there were county there were town there were village manor courts church courts church courts in particular and he wasn't getting rid of any of them but he did want to make a, a simpler system um and he didn't like the fact that the church courts could try anyone and if they said they were a cleric and they could recite certain bible verses whether they were murderers rapists or whatever they could claim benefit of clergy and it meant they couldn't be sentenced um to death and it actually was a custom he wanted to revive rather than a new one. Um, and he felt that um, clerics that were convicted of murder, rape or robbery should be dealt with by the law of the land, not the law of the church. Thomas, of course, disagreed, already having let off the murder in his own church court. Henry stated the church was subject to the law of the land. Becky thought the church was above the law. And accordingly, he also thought he was. So then we get the the various meetings that the two had. He tries to escape. Henry goes, isn't it big enough for the two of us then, this, world, uh, this land? And in 1164, it ended up with a big council being called. And uh, Thomas got charged with contempt for royal authority. And he still defied the king, <clears throat> who then was at his... Um, well, rather fed up with the man, and in a reasonable way asked him that um, he wanted the accounts belonging to the chancellorship because obviously they'd never been delivered, which was a reasonable request, actually. Mm. Um, and even his own bishop said, oh, for goodness sake, be reasonable or resign. 
Uh, one of them actually accused him of disloyalty to the king and trying to subvert the law. Mm. But instead of sorting things out, he decided to disappear. And he went to France and nobody knew where he'd gone for a while. And he went to the Pope and he told him he was being persecuted. <laughs> and he got the Pope to admonish the king. Charm again. Did a whole charm offensive on the Pope. Um, and the bishops, various bishops, actually defended Henry. Uh, and they told the Pope the Archbishop had not been exiled, but had voluntarily left. Um, and by the way, in disguise. Um, and obviously, it's a lot more involved than that. There's there's heck of a lot to the story, which I, I do write about. Yeah. So what does Thomas do next? Oh, series of excommunications. How best can he provoke the king? <laughs> um, he excommunicates most of his uh, courtiers. He sends menacing letters. Uh, and the Pope, for some strange reason, made him legate of all England. <laughs> now we could personally threaten the king by um, threatening him to uh, with excommunication. And then the next threat was to lay England under an interdict, of course, which of course means all church services stop, um, people can't be buried, people can't be christened, all those sort of things. Um, and the, the argument rumbles on and there are you know, various attempts to mediate between them. Um, and he, he just carried on staying obdurate. He knew his rights. He was going to have them. Um, and he, he got the upper hand when he made it look as if Henry had disobeyed the Pope. When they had a very strange custom on the continent of crowning the heir. So you almost had like two kings. Right. But it wasn't really supposed to be that way. And um, he demanded the right to crown Henry's son. And of course, that didn't happen because Henry had already got permission from the Pope to do something else, and then the Pope rescinded it. But he, he sent it to Thomas, who just held it back. Uh, so at that point, Henry's having to give in, and Thomas comes back to England. He's, he's, he's won everything he's wanted. He's got Henry to agree to everything. And December 1170, he acts like he's a minor king, I mean, actually, the chronicler says his face was shining when he sat on his throne in the cathedral. And what did he do on Christmas Day when he wasn't supposed to be doing so? He excommunicated the king's most intimate counsellors, at which point um, the, the, um, the story is Henry exploded and wanted you know, somebody to get rid of the knights, uh, um, sorry, the archbishop, and four knights took him at his word although he always maintained he, he didn't actually mean it. But the story down now is, of course, they came over the channel because Henry was spending Christmas over the channel. And um, there's a full account in the book, so I'm not sort of going to go into the full details here. But we know we definitely provoked the knights into doing what they did because there are accounts written at the time by men who knew him. Five of them witnessed the murder. And the earliest account was from his friend, John of Salisbury. And uh, of course, Henry's made the villain, which I can't quite agree. The murder went around in record time. Um, but John of Salisbury account shows he provoked them into fury because he actually says to Thomas, why exasperate these men with bitter speeches? You would do better giving a milder answer. And uh, the monks actually tried to protect him from the knights coming down the corridors and they shut the doors. He opened them again. Um, and in Grimm's account, he heard uh, after the murder, one of the monks say he was justly served. And another, he wished to be king and more than king. And I thought, actually, that, that did sum Thomas up. And um, but after the murder... <laughs> the king found the archbishop alive was nothing like the problem he now faced that he was dead <laughs> um, and that's you know goes into another saga of the pope you know uh, well it just goes around europe and i think what struck me after the death was one of the monks saying that they turned the body face upwards and that he was almost smiling and i thought do you know i could believe that you know because he, he when you read it you just feel he deliberately sought his death he, he you know and then what happened next i really found appalling what happens <laughs> next? It's, i mean because we, we all know this story of you will no one rid me of this turbulent priest so it's sort of you know <laughs> that awful moment of someone overhearing yeah. and thinking 
oh yeah, he wants, wants us to kill him. And, you know, it's Richard Burton and he's handsome and we can't kill Richard Burton. And we oh, sort yeah. Of, <laughs> of Thomas, oh, of Thomas cool. Beckett. Yeah, well, huh. what did strike me and that was appalling next was the monks, you know, they go they go to wash him and they find he's got a hair shirt and he's, he's gone for the whole biz there and he's absolutely teeming with lice. Yeah. And like sensible people, they decided to just leave it alone. Um, but they scraped up his brains and his blood and they also put a pot under the buyer that his beer, sorry, that his um, body was on. And by morning, hey, lo and behold, there were miracles. There were miracles being spread abroad. And they then got little bottles and they actually sold it. They diluted it with blood and brains, all mixed with water, put little drops into clay bottles, which at first, and this was the amazing thing, cracked or exploded until they began using tin bottles. And the next thing, we got miracles all over Europe. And the Pope ended up canonising him on 21st of February. And poor old Henry, he had to pay penance at the tomb later on and say, oh, yes, he was terribly sorry. Yes, he was a saint. And, um, you know, (laughs) I mean, obviously, it's a lot more involved than that. And there's more in the book. um, But, uh, well, I'd be talking for a much longer time. (laughs) Well, that's worth the cover price of the book alone, I think. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um, let's move on to um, it's not a secret on history hack my favorite part of this bit of history uh, involves a lion who sucks his thumb <laughs> cries for his mum um a pox on the phony king of england uh because as far as i'm concerned disney's robin hood is a documentary and that is exactly what <laughs> was. And no. I've, I've just mortally no. offended our guest because lo and behold, we found someone who loves him. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, at least way. have a pet snake. <laughs> <laughs> All I can say is our English chroniclers left rather a lot out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, were, there were so many parts to the king I found when I started looking. He turned out to be my favourite for many reasons. After Go on, rehabilitate King John, <laughs> travelling around in the wall. Well, okay. Are you ready? Oh, and that's another bit as well. Remind me of that in a minute. <laughs> After looking at his brother and his father and remembering from childhood, like yourself, evil King John, I tried to track him down. Uh, you know, people were saying he was cold-hearted, he was cruel, he was bad, he was irreligious. I didn't find that, actually. I spent a lot of time, actually more than I ought to have done, <laughs> searching for these terrible things he'd done, and I didn't find them. Well, possibly one, and even that I believe he made reparation for. Uh, other people can think differently, but that's the beauty of history. Yeah. But for me, I discovered a man I liked. <clears throat> uh, so let's take the church first. <clears throat> the church's opinion of him is almost bipolar. At first, child. Church chroniclers actually did say Say. good things of him. Um, And for someone regarded as so irreligious, in 1200, he did something surprising. King John honoured the deceased Hugh Bishop of Lincoln by personally, and I don't know any other king that's done this, carrying his coffin through muddy streets with the rain pouring down upon him. But then you see King John argued with the Pope and his image went down the tubes. Now, when I first started this process, I didn't really know what had caused the big argument. And I was quite surprised when I found out what it was. What was he'd it? Elect- <laughs> he'd elected a new Archbishop of Canterbury when his loyal friend, Archbishop of Canterbury, Hubert Water, who was also the Chancellor, died in 1205. But the younger monks of Canterbury decided they, they wanted their own Archbishop. So <laughs> they elected in the middle of the night <laughs> A less well-educated sub-prior called Reginald. <laughs> they whispered the ceremony and then they said, now get out of the country quick. And they sent him to go secretly to the Pope before King John found out. Meanwhile, John had elected a very eminent, very learned man, John Gray, Bishop of Norwich. Okay. Uh, but he only found out what the monks had done when the Pope sent a letter saying, I've had three delegations here. Can you tell me why? <laughs> but John thought, Oh, well, the Pope will sort it and he'll do what, you know, 
do the, the, the right thing and, and do the learned man and all that. <clears throat> uh, but when the Pope made his decision in 1207, he decided, without John's consent, to elect and consecrate his choice, which was a cardinal who was an intimate of the French king who'd been John's enemy for years. Please so tell us a so I'm noticing a, um, a reoccurring theme of scamp-like skullduggery popes just messing with English kings. Oh, yeah. And if you think that's bad, you should know what they did even in Norman times. But that's another story. Uh, yeah, I've been quite shocked at what um, how much interference we've had in this um, in the history of our country from the popes. Anyway. <clears throat> And, and, you know, the Pope's done an enemy who's supposed to work closely with John. And, and John was a tad furious, <laughs> to put it, I suppose, lightly. And, and he did shout at the monks. He told them that had they behaved like grown men worthy of his trust, the affairs of the kingdom would have been in capable hands. And yes, he cursed them. He told them they were childish and irresponsible. And the interdict really arose. Um, because John absolutely refused to let the Cardinal take up his position and the Pope couldn't countenance a king refusing to obey him. And he determined to bring him down. It's, it's almost as simple as that. And the, the person he chose was uh, somebody called Stephen Langton. So when he consistently refused to let the man enter the country, the Pope, that's when he placed England under the interdict. Uh, and of course, at the time, as I say, churches wouldn't open, the bells were removed, relics and images were stored away. Um, you could only have prayers and sermons in churchyards. Um, christings were allowed in private houses, as were offices of the dead. Um, churchings, you know, when women had been uh, given birth and weddings, they took place in the church porch. And yeah, John was angry again, and he ordered all priests to leave the kingdom. But he calmed down. And some of his bishops stayed completely loyal to him, which people don't ever seem to know. And he also ordered for the clergy who stayed despite his displeasure, but especially the poor, he ordered an allowance of food and clothing to be given out. When that threat did not work, the Pope excommunicated him personally and ordered it was unlawful for any to dine with him or give him food or drink. But his bishops refused to issue it. The ones loyal to him, I mean, not, not all of them. In Christmas 1211, he extended it to include all the people who associated with him. But it didn't stop anyone from being at court in Christmas or March uh, when he gave a banquet and knighted Prince Alexander of Scotland. And there's another little bit of the story here. State records reveal just one little instance. And during 1211, 1212, King John purchased nearly half a million sorted herrings to supply nunneries all over England. And he supplied firewood. But that was church people. Did he do anything similar elsewhere? Yeah, he did. An example is May 1205. He ordered the following. And this is quoting the actual proclamation. Excuse me. <clears throat> because of the severe frost and frozen land of last winter, loaves and pottage are to be made either from flour, beans or peace to feed paupers throughout London, Oxford and all the western and southern counties so they may be sustained and the parish not. John only submitted in the end to the Pope because the Pope decreed in December 1212 that John should be deposed and he offered the English crown to King Philip of France, who surely could not believe his luck. <laughs> He'd been fighting for it forever. <laughs> Uh, or perhaps he already knew from his intimate friend, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And the Pope also sent letters to all of John's barons, saying they were released from their allegiance to him. Um, and we'll just leave the story here for a moment. According to English chroniclers, and I hope you don't mind me going on so much. I love it. It's what you're here for. It's fine. <laughs> this, is a, this is a safe um, space. You can go on as much as you like. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anyway, there's this impression of a soft sword king that he was only interested in staying in bed and losing all his dominions in France because he couldn't care less. And that's what made him lose the respect of his barons. Well, that's, that's quite funny, really, because in France he was sort of rather highly because 
he's dashing all over the place in, in his uh, own dominions across the seas, trying to stop King Philip taking them over. Taking an incident from 1201, John's away fighting King Philip in France, and he hears his mother is being besieged at Mirabeau Castle by his upstart nephew, Arthur of Brittany. Now, our soft sword king rode day and night and arrived so quickly that one of the knights was so confident it couldn't be him that he said, I'm not arming, it's not him, can't possibly be. And he insisted on finishing his pigeon pie breakfast. <laughs> A party rode out to uh, um, actually, when they realised it could be a, an enemy approaching, and when they saw who it was, they turned tail to flee back into the castle. But John was faster still. He beat them back in, and at his first sword stroke, severed the hand of a fully armoured knight. Mm. Now, we don't get this in our chronicles. This is from a Flemish chronicle. I found this. Um, completely different uh, viewpoint of what's going on in overseas. Of course, <clears throat> he takes Arthur prisoner, and he did later die. And King Philip was a master of propaganda and innuendo. And it seems people really believe someone like King John would take him out in a rowing boat on his own and murder him. There were many rumours. I tried to track down the stories and the stories of the prisoners he's supposed to have starved to death. Funnily enough, I found some well and kicking. <laughs> One in particular um, was a man called Saverick de Molian. I probably haven't pronounced that correctly, but uh, he made an unsuccessful prison breakout from Corfe Castle. Well, he's not, it's not even like a John Smith, is it? There's only one of these with that name. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, he became a trusted partisan and he started fighting for John uh, across the seas became so trusted by John that on his deathbed, he named him as one of the executive of his will to look after his son. And this is someone, you know, way back then. So we're talking 15 years. In 1203, you know, Prince, um, King, sorry, King Philip, um, he's attacking Chateau Galliard. In fact, he attacks all the castles. John revealed a genius strategy, uh, which they attempted but it was unsuccessful and he comes back in December of that year after setting up the defensive line with his barons in Normandy <clears throat> and he comes back to England where he actually criticises the barons for not, not coming over to help him. While he's in England, King Philip tells those people still fighting for John, hey, he's abandoned you and either they paid homage to him or he would play them alive. I think if anyone could be called wicked, I, I would nominate King Philip, actually, for some of the things he does. I wish I could have put some of the other things he did into the book. But, of course, we're writing about John and England. So why the character assassination? You know, I mean, we, we all we all know that there are kings who <coughs> get a little bit of a rough deal by history and weren't nearly as bad as, <laughs> as they are, they're made out to be. And so certain is, big fat ginger ones that deserve more aggro than they get as well. Right. <laughs> so what what was it about John that made I mean, well, is it history being written by the winners? Is it why why I, is he so maligned? Well, I would say that it was it was a combination of lots of things really. There was his fight with the Pope that weakened his own authority in the country. There were the barons saying, well, actually there's a little bit um, a, I've got a little anecdote a bit further down, actually, um, which will explain a few things there. There was the fact that our chroniclers were written by churchmen, mm -hmm. so they had their own take on things. Then you've got, as I say, the French and Flemish that had a different take on him, which showed him as a very good warrior and, and winning battles. I think the best wheeze was uh, with King King Philip was um, had a lot more money than John. That that didn't help. <clears throat> so uh, his best wheeze actually, which didn't help things for John, was um, he confiscated English lords' estates in France ah. in twelve oh five, and um, his English barons begged him to allow them to go to the French court to pay homage so they wouldn't lose those estates and 
And they actually said to John, and you know, we we're talking about this evil, bad-tempered, cruel man. Mm -hmm. Um, though they might pledge their bodies to King Philip, John had their hearts. And one of John's closest friends said, who was at the meeting, of course, the decision is yours, but in your shoes, if I saw them acting against my interests, though their hearts were for me, if only I could get my hands on these dissidents' hearts, I would chuck them all down the nearest privy. <laughs> nice. Which, which made the king laugh. And this is where I say it's got a decent sense of humour. So the next problem he has um, is King Philip's not going to go away. No matter how successful he is, he's going to continue fighting him. And the English barons don't want to go because there's nothing in it for them anymore. And although he forced him into a two-year truce and things like that, the constant warfare was obviously a drain on government revenue, which is John's revenue, of course, which we all know means raising taxes. And he raised fines, he raised feudal dues. Now he gets told that, you know, people say, oh, he's an extortionate king, which he probably was, but then a lot of them were. And then you've got the Pope stepping over and giving Philip carte blanche to bring an army over. And the other problem John had was he had officers that he trusted. And when he trusted you, you know, that was that was his loyalty. And he found his English nobles wanting. You weren't his trust. And I think one of the remarkable things about John, again, I don't think gets mentioned often, he employed both men and women so long as he trusted them. You could call him an equal opportunity employer. <laughs> and he made Nicola LaHaye not only constable of Lincoln Castle, but she was the sheriff of Lincoln. He employed a woman called Joan who kept his hounds and had the rank of a sergeant. Anyway, we, we go past all this and let's go towards near the end of his reign the end, and his excommunication. It goes back to France. He's actually has a triumphant campaign despite his English barons. Um, and, and they refused to serve him overseas and they refused to pay him scootage, which is a fee in place of their going, which is, you know, other kings had used it as a way of paying mercenaries instead of taking them. So <clears throat> the next shot of what happens, we got the um, barons attending, the rebel barons, it's not all of them, mm. uh, they attend a council in full armour and they complain that he trusts, he's, he's trusting foreigners in government. And, and it's there. They should be doing that. It's their right. And he doesn't trust them. It's as simple as that, really. And then they go on to say, <clears throat> we want the good laws of England restored. You know, those are King Edward, I presume King Edward the Confessor, and mm -hmm. his grandfather, Henry I. And when he was given all the demands by guess who? Stephen Langton, Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was very angry and said, well, why didn't they ask for my kingdom as well? Well, they, in a way, they did. For under Magna Carta, which, of course, we're all going to come to at some point, uh, which was signed and sealed at Runnymede, as we all know, the mercenaries uh, were ordered to leave England by John fulfilling his obligations. And they joke, uh, King John, 26th King of England, because um, he's had to agree that he'll be ruled via a committee of 25 barons. Uh, but... Yeah. King John fulfills his obligations. OK, he was waiting for the Pope to give a ruling to say that it was unlawful. Uh, but the rebel nobles didn't stick to theirs. For, they didn't comply. They attacked his manors. They attacked the forests. They felled and sold timber. They butchered his game. And, and one thing I, I do miss out of the book because I couldn't verify it myself. I didn't find it. But in another history book, they said that a contemporary had written that the 25 were at the king's court to make a judgment. And when they found John ill in bed and unable to walk, they refused to uh, go to his chamber, saying he would have to be carried into theirs. Now, if that's true, that just shows the arrogance, I think. Um, and, of course, I don't go into all the detail of why there are books on the subject. Oh, do you know what? It's, it's, this is, <laughs> and it's this too is involved. A this is another reason to to buy your book, Jan, to, to get this from from the ground because you know we've we've covered Magna Carta on here, I think a couple of times, and it is it's an interesting um, 
bit of history that is so fundamental to everything we yeah. know now. The Pope's legate that came across, he believed Archbishop Stephen was the instigator, by the way, of the Baron's decision to make war. And um, and I did feel John was a much maligned man and had unreasonable bad press, as you can tell. But I wanted to just give you one example of his sense of humour that made me like him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's from April 1209. He's travelling north and he's approached Sandwick. Uh, and he, he gets mired in a pool and he arrives in the town wet and muddy. And this is a man, you know, supposed to be one of these nasty people. The following day, he decreed that henceforth on St. Mark's Day, which was the day before, before a freeman be first admitted to the common, he must subject himself to the same filthy ablution by walking through a mire to be wet and mud begrimed as a punishment and reminder to maintain their ropes. <laughs> now, this one I found in the Chambers Book of Days, and I had John's itinerary and I was able to pin it down to that year, the 1209. Uh, but what I really was amazed by <laughs> was <laughs> until 1854, St. Mark's Day was marked at Anwick by a strange custom that persons receiving the privilege of Freeman and the Common marched on horseback in great ceremony, dressed in white, dismounted, deliberately walked into a large dirty pool, leaving it begrimed with mud dripping all over. They change their clothes, they have a dram, they have a ceremonial reception in town, and they call at each other's houses to have more drink. <laughs> and it went on for, you know, 700 years. <laughs> and I think, you know, what he did was ignored a lot by English writers, and he was a wonderful warrior. Uh, and um, I, on the day of his death, the greatest irony of all was all his rebels, no, not all of them, 40 of them, were sending letters asking to come back into the royal fold. And um, it would have been interesting to find out what would have happened next had he lived. And I thought that was one of the saddest things out of the whole lot of his reign. <laughs> it's just incredible. I mean, he's, he is so much more than our lovely cartoon lion. And I can't, I can't mm. quite believe that Disney <laughs> would play fast and loose with the historical record. Um, really? <laughs> Um, well, um, I expect some people wouldn't agree with what I found in, you know, the way I I, I think it came across to me. I, I accept that. But I actually like the man I found. Plantagenet things to talk about that I know make Charlie very excited. But thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.